Something like that. Yes. Okay. So, um, and then I'll take that little snippet mm-hmm. and I'll put it on somebody else's show. So okay. you, you get a promo on more than one show, you say. That's cool for you. Got it. And it's okay for me to name, name the mention of, uh, mention the name you of my firm? You definitely want to say whatever you want to say, Innovative okay. Planning Partners or your URL, whatever you want to say. Yep. Say that sure. too. Um, yep. Yeah. And then have fun with it. So it's a little okay. bit of an outtake. So when you sure. hear your show, right, yep. there'll be somebody else acting goofy with me talking about their stuff momentarily yeah. and then there'll be an yeah. intro and then there'll be you and me talking i heard on one of your podcasts i heard a young lady doing exactly this okay good so yeah. no angry emails afterwards saying what the hell's going on <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. okay not at all. as a matter of fact i appreciate you putting me on your show i okay. really do of course i appreciate you being here okay so whenever you're ready for take one hit it okay um one or three two one Hi, I'm Dan Angeloni from Innovative Planning Partners, and you're listening to Vroom Vroom Veer, so listen up. Well done, sir. Thank you. All right, I'm going to hit stop, and I'll be right back. I'll be right here. Okay. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Jason Parker, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Veer, and welcome to the show. How's it going? Jeff Smith, thank you so much for having me as a guest. I appreciate it. It's going great. Cool. So uh, let's talk a little bit briefly about soundretirementplanning.com. What's, uh, what are you most excited about in your business today? You know what I'm most excited about is I had the opportunity. I've been developing some software, software as a service, for the last year and a half. It's called retirementbudgetcalculator.com. Yeah, check that out. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So for people getting ready to retire, the most important number they need to know if they're going to work with an advisor is really how much they spend. And I found that there weren't any really great tools out there. So I invented the retirement budget calculator to help people have a better spending plan as they're getting ready to retire. So I'm really excited about that. But we have thousands of people listening to the pod, my podcast uh, every week. We've got um, my book, Made It to a Number One Bestseller on Amazon. I mean, I've just got all kinds of great things. We, we work and serve with amazing people um, all over the country. And so a lot of, a lot of really great things happening uh, from a business standpoint. Yeah. You know, I checked out your retirement calendar and it looks very cool. I didn't buy it yet, but I might because I think what Um, yours offers is a lot different than a lot of the free ones out there because the free ones. Yeah. I mean, the free ones kind of like leave out all the good stuff. (laughs) Really? Well, yeah, there is nothing that's free. I mean, you know, we thought about making ours an ad based model, but in order to do that, you got to harvest a lot of people, uh, data from people. And what we wanted to do was create a tool that protected people's privacy, let them pay a fee for it, but then they don't have to see a bunch of ads as a result. So you, you pay one way or the other. Sure. We just, I'm just big into protecting people's privacy. And let me tell you, if, before you sign up for the um, calculator, we have a a special coupon code right now. Cool. Where you get 50 percent off, just oh, nice. use the coupon code podcast. It's a one time fee right now. It's only twenty. Uh, it's normally fifty four dollars, but you'll get it for twenty seven dollars, and it's not a subscription cost. So you know this isn't oh, something that's, gonna, that's at that's least better. at least not yet. We are down we are the road probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we're going to be switching to that. But people that sign up under the old uh, one time fee, they're not going to. They're going to oh, get grandfathered, get grandfathered in. in. Ooh, yeah. so do it now. Do it 27 now. Seven bucks, man. Yeah, <laughs> I'm and, I'm and, doing it now. I'm going to do that now. <laughs> I'm going to. It's good. Yes, that's that's cool because that's what like I was like well let me talk to this guy first and see if there's an offer first <laughs> well, I'm glad I, you waited. I, yeah and, and I hope you take PayPal because that's where I, I, you know that's not required because 27 bucks is 27 bucks but no you know we use stripe for processing oh, right, all right. credit cards but it's um, you know we also have a guarantee on there it says for 30 days if you're not happy oh, nice. with it let us know. we'll give you your money back oh, that's and perfect. 
we had like eight an eight hundred percent increase already uh, in people signing up just this month. So I, yeah, I'm really excited about that because it's a way for especially for people that are never going to hire a financial advisor, but they're trying they're do it yourselfers. They want to have a better plan. Right. Uh, the calculator is really exciting and. The community that's really, I think, most excited about it are the people that are in that FIRE community, fi- uh, right. financially independent, retired early. These right. are you know, people that have I, uh, they're smart, they're educated. I am deeply aware of the FIRE community. Yes, yes. I love it. Yeah. So yeah. these guys are saying, look, we don't need to pay a lot of fees to somebody. We just need the tools to help us do a better job. Right. And so people that like to follow somebody like Mr. Money Mustache, you know, the yes. reason he was love able it. to retire so early isn't be- – he only saved a little bit more than a million dollars. He didn't really save that much money. But right. he's he's fanatical about his Keeping spending. His spending down. Right. Yeah, he rides a bike everywhere. I know. Of driving He's got cars, a. Ni- so. the, he is b- why I bought a Nissan Leaf. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> and I love it. Let me tell you, um, if you haven't taken the plunge into the electric car, if your commute is under thirty miles one way, you can do it. I'll say that you can you can I... you can get a cheap Nissan Leaf used and use it as your commute car. I have thought about that several times. I drive a Subaru myself. I love yeah. Subarus, but I'm on my third Subaru. But Subaru's I was great. out hiking the other day, and there were these guys that had these um, – it's like an electronic unicycle, uh, like oh, a one-wheel. Oh, wow. Have, have you seen these things? No. Oh, man. It's like a wheel. You stand on a pedal on either side of it, and it's got a gyro in there. So oh, it's yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. Okay, segways, you know? Okay. And they, the guy was telling me that you can go about 18 miles on a charge, and it goes 35 miles per hour. And my office is 13 miles from my house. I was thinking, man, I could just get one of those, put a big flag on the back of it, and get a helmet with like little spikes coming off the top, yeah. and just cruise to work on one you of those. Could. That might be good. You could. <laughs> You're not going to, but you could. Uh, no, I, I mean, <laughs> my wife, she's always teased me for being a, a dork and a nerd, anyways. But that might just be pushing it too far. So I used to ride my bike to work when I worked in LA and it was like 11 miles one way. But let me tell you, it's like taking your life in your own hands. It's fine. So you have to figure it out. You can't go on the main streets. You have to go through the neighborhoods. Elsewise, you'll get killed. (laughs) (laughs) So you would have to do the same thing. You can go on Google Maps because I did it and you can actually click on bike, right? There's a route routing for a bike on Google Maps and it'll tell you the safe route to use for a bicycle and it'll take you off of all the main drags. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad I'm on the show. I learned something new all, just now. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. <clears throat> so these guys, so these guys that were on these electronic one wheels, they yeah. were out riding the mountain bike trails. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, that's, that's kind of cool. So wow. anyways, life, life is changing, man. It's getting better and better all the time. That's neat. So these things are like all terrain. <laughs> yeah, they had knobby tires. On. I've been thinking about buying a motorcycle, like a little, yeah. uh, dual sport. But after I saw these guys, I'm like, no, I'm going to get one of those. And wow, I'm going to have yeah. to check that out. That's neat. Or yeah. you can just put a little motor on a bicycle. Yeah, well, my neighbors, they're 70-something. Yeah. They, they, that's what they just bought was electronic bicycles yeah. so that they don't pedal right. uphill anymore. Yeah, perfect. Because it, it, I like the kind that do both, you know, that you can pedal when you want to, but then if you get tired, you can, you know, use the little battery motor thingy. The only thing is, man, I think that movie Wally, the cartoon about, you know, the future, I, I'm worried that we're, we're all going to end up... <laughs> Fat and lazy. Floating Being, beds with devices in front right, of our faces. With robots our, feeding our, us. Ex, yes. Our extra big Slurpees. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost there. We're almost We're there. Close. We've got a lot of people that need, uh, you know, couchectomies, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so let's, let's go back in time and talk about you uh, because you had like this uh, obsession with money. That I want to talk about. So you you mentioned you used to launder money when you were twelve years old. Um, so which, which you know. I'm making up. You know, um, it, you didn't really do that, but you kind of did. You literally did it, not figuratively. So tell us the story about you and your money laundering days back when you were twelve. Man, it makes me so nervous when you say that because the the regulatory environment that I operate in, we're a registered investment advisory firm, and we so we have this like incredible hurdle for everything we say being compliant. And uh, so I'm when sorry, you, I'm we, sorry, no, regulators. No, it, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> I know, no, I know, I know. It's it's fun, but it's a true story. So I have always been a bit obsessive with money, even as a kid. Like when I would go and buy magazines at the store, I'd buy Money Magazine, and wow. I remember. I was buying I, mad. 
Yeah, it was kind of weird. That's still kind of weird. But I, um, I was also, uh, I had a lawn mowing business when I, I think I was 11 when I started it. And I had so many of my neighbors that wanted us to help that I couldn't do it all on my own. So then I had to get some of my friends involved. And that was really my first experience with a business. But afterwards, people would pay me. You know, it's not like the world we live today where everybody just kind of sending money electronically through their phone. People would actually give me these crusty dollar bills. Right. And I would bring them home. And I would put them in the sink and I'd wash them and then I'd blow dry them straight on the counter. And I'll never forget the time I, you know, I brought this perfectly crisp, clean money into the bank. I had blow dried it and made it just as nice as I could. I deposited it. And then a couple of weeks I went la- uh, later, I went back to get my money out of the bank and she handed me this money that was all crumpled up and gross. And I was like, wait a second, this isn't my money. And so that was the first time I realized <laughs> that they weren't, if, they weren't just holding on to your money, you know? It's just... <laughs> so yes, it's true. I used to wash my money as a kid. It's, don't do that anymore, thankfully. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> So did you wash the money that you got back from the bank too? No. Uh, did, you, did you have a little, oh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Epiphany. Yeah, I, no, no I was, OCD was where I was going. You had oh, like one no, of those no. germ phobias or something. No, it wasn't really a germ thing. I just wanted my money to be clean and straight. And I, it did okay. continue on into my teenage years. You know, some of the people listening to your show probably don't even remember what a cassette tape is. But when I was no, a teenager. No. My audience should know what a cassette tape is. Cassette I hope and so. And 8-tracks. Well, I'm aiming that way anyway. Well, I don't know much about 8-tracks. But my son and daughter <laughs> have no idea what a cassette tape is, even though I've got a whole closet full of them. Right. But I remember being obsessed with those, too. I would. I mean, I love, as a teenager, I don't know about you, man, but I loved music. Music. And so I would take my cassette tapes and I didn't want them, I didn't want the covers to get all scratched up. So I would take the cassette out and then I would wrap those in toilet paper and put them in plastic bags and tape them all up and then label them. So I, because I, I didn't want my plastic covers to get, I, I, man, maybe we shouldn't even be having this conversation. People no, are going to be no, like, this guy's it, the greatest dude I've ever heard on this not show. Not at all. <laughs> no, you're, you're being honest and open about your affliction. <laughs> I'm it's, teasing. I'm, I'm, I'm better. You know, I'm You're, better. You've gotten better. Okay. okay. I like to think I get a little better every day. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, so I, I, if we're going to share, I'll share too. So I was like this annoying, like third of three kid. Um, and so I'm, psychologists have this whole profile of birth order and all these other things. It's very much like astrology. But the, one of the common traits of, of third-born kids of three is they're like <clears throat> attention wanters, right? Um, and this is so you, whenever you see like pictures of me like as a little kid, I'm like sticking my face in the camera going, look at me! <laughs> you, you were the photo bomber. I, I can, was the I photo bomber. It. I was always like just dying for attention. Just look at me, look at me all the time. So, and then, you know, what that translates to is this weird public fearlessness that has gotten me into all kinds of trouble. <laughs> oh, <laughs> My, really? Yeah. Public fearless. So you're one. Of, you're not afraid of speaking publicly no, like a lot of people, all. huh? No. Oh not man, all. that's I know. what a gift. It is a huge gift. But all superpowers are a curse slash blessing. It's like a blurs. They're 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 a mixed thing. It's like one and the same. It, as long as you, you know, learn to control your power by going to the Xavier School for Gifted Children. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah, well, I got into all kinds of trouble because, you know, right out of high school, I joined the military. And, uh, you know, totally naive, totally clueless, totally fearless in front of people. Oh, my goodness. I got in so much trouble. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. So we're all weird. Don't worry about it. It's good. Oh, man, I love that, though. You know, and I love that each of us are given strengths because mine was not public speaking. I was so the first I mean, I've learned to be a public speaker now because I have to for the work that I do. But like the first time I was ever interviewed on a radio show, I was trembling. My voice was cracking. I was so nervous. Or the first time I had to give a presentation in front of a group of people, I forgot what my name was. I couldn't remember the name of my company. I mean, I was sweating. it It was horrible. Horrible, but I've gotten better uh, because I have to do it a lot. Right. But uh, it wasn't easy for me, not like you. It's not. I don't think it's a natural thing. I think it's weird for people like me that want to. 
it's it's and it also sort of like makes you makes you horribly insecure <laughs> like when <laughs> i if i i have a job where it's my job to take care of like uh like 20 or so um federal employees for the department of energy now and hmm. i'm kind of like just their it support but it's super simple right but a lot of times, you know, they're out traveling, doing their job or maybe taking some time off. And I can literally go like a whole day with not interacting with people at all. <laughs> I mean, I have to go out of my way sometimes to like, you know, I'll, they'll give me other stuff to do that's like nerdy. Oh, hmm. uh, update the asset database. Oh, great. <laughs> all right. So I'll work on that all day, but I'll never actually talk to people. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I get thoroughly depressed on those days. It's just like, ah. nobody loves me. <laughs> That's interesting. Right. Well, it makes sense. It makes sense that you're doing a podcast where you get to pe- talk to people all over the country. Right. So. Exactly. There you go. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how you got into the personal finance business because it started, it seems like you were, you were there already, like really young, right? I mean, you were obsessed with money already, but how did you officially graduate into being a financial planner? Yes. So I had the good fortune. I didn't realize you could have a career uh, helping other people with money until I was in my mid twenties. And in my mid twenties, I had the really good fortune. I had actually had been working in um, the political arena, helping raise money for various nonprofit organizations. For uh, and I was just all jazzed up. I love America, and I was just trying to get more people involved in um, being an American and okay. helping them understand that their voice matters. And uh, and then I went to work for some banks. After that career, um, moved up to Alaska for a little while and Fun. worked at some banks up there. I worked for the Alaska Commission on Post-Secondary Education for a little while. Got your oil uh, checks. Good for you. I moved down <laughs> to uh, moved down to Washington, and oh, I was nice. just so I had I, I, and that's when I was doing the work for the political organizations. I, and I just got burnt out, man. I felt like I was just spinning my wheels, talking to people about the same thing. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. So I called my dad and I said, hey, dad, I need to make a career change. And he said, well, I have a friend in Florida that's having a lot of success with this great big company. Why don't you call him? So I did. And then that guy referred me to a guy in Seattle. And then the guy in Seattle referred me to the district manager, which was a man who ended up becoming my mentor, Dean. And um, I, and one of the things I try to teach people, Jeff, all the time is one relationship can totally change your life. And for so me, true. I was, a, I was, you know, a young man in my mid twenties and I met my mentor, Dean, he was in his mid sixties or early sixties at the time. Wow. And, uh, and yeah, he took me under his wing, taught me everything. He had owned his own broker dealer, um, back in Montana years earlier and just really taught me the ropes. He invested in me, not just his time, but he invested money, uh, to help me start my own independent investment advisor firm. But without that one relationship, without that mentorship, I never would have had the opportunity that I have today. So I just, uh, at this point in my career, I am now trying to create those, um, mentor opportunities opportunities for other people. I'm trying to bring right, other right. people in underneath me so that I can help them the same way that I was given an opportunity. So one relationship can change your life. And the other thing along those same lines is I noticed the first person I called when I wanted to make a change was my dad. My dad connected me to his friend. His friend connected me to the guy in Seattle. The other thing I found is these connections in our life are so important. One of the things I like to geek out on these days is I think about how am I connected to different people? Like how did the relationship come to be? And what I've found is that most of the relationships in my life are a result of just a handful of people. So my dad's a huge connector for me. My wife is a huge connector for me. And then my mentor, my friend Dean, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he's a huge connector. So most of the relationships I have today, I can connect, I can trace back to these few people as I connect the dots, like how did it come to be? Right. And once you recognize who these important people are in your life that connect you with all of these other folks, man, you gotta, you gotta just, you got, you got Protect those relationships. You got to spend more time with those people, and and ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what life is really all about. It's about the people, and it's about the relationships. So that's something I'm passionate about today. That's fun. I mean, you know, I just had a, a really cool conversation with another buddy of mine, and and basically, it was it was similar to what you just were talking about about how like blessed you know I felt, I feel now. Um, uh, just these very few, just a handful of interactions 
with like one dude, right? Really set me up for success. It was almost like he just was like a time traveler sent by God or something. (laughs) Mm. Is really kind of like what it felt like because he just showed up and then went away. I really don't even remember the guy's name, but I saw him like three times in my life. But he Mm. said, you know, what are you doing other than maxing out your IRA and where are you putting your money? And Mm. right. And then, oh, and I think the third time I saw him, the second time I saw him, he said, you can do way better than just max out your IRAs. You should, you know, it was more of that like message of um, the fire movement of, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't really need to spend all of your money. You should be really thinking about saving now um, Mm -hmm. as much as you can. That message. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I think I saw him like the third time and the third time I saw him, uh, it was funny because I met him in Florida he was the staff sergeant that worked in the uh, wing history office, okay? Um, and I worked in the wing quality office. I literally only met him like twice or three times in my life. Mm. Um, so the third time, we were both in uh, Prince Sultan Air Base in Saudi Arabia. And I was getting ready to leave, and he just got there, and I saw him on a bus. <laughs> and he said, wow. hey, man, how you doing? And I was like, I got a lot of money. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like this high five moment of thank mm. you. Thank you for everything you did for me because if it weren't for you, I would I would be, you know, like where everybody else is. A, a lot of mm. people unfortunately um is just you never get to learn these these key lessons um that all the fire people now are learning really early, which is great, but like the baby boomer, baby boomer people or people getting ready to retire are now looking and saying, Jesus, my 401k even going to be enough? That kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So it's tough. Yeah. Well, and there's no way to answer the question of it's going to be enough unless you understand your spending. And that's why, again, right. I created yes. my budget calculator, retirement budget calculator. But no, I got lucky on that, too, because we can go into this now because um, I – I got uh, my wife does all of the checkbook stuff. So she does all the bill paying and making sure she's got enough in the checkbook to, you know, pay all the bills and make sure uh-huh. I, I'm making enough money. <laughs> mm. That's always a point of contention. Hey, you, you need to go make more money. But, um, you know, so it was easy for me to just say, how much money do we need every month? Mm. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and she went, well, let me go check. And she just pulled out all the just, just like one of these bookkeeper nazis you know <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and she just she's the me. nerd yes she's, yeah. the, she's the money geek yeah i'm like the investor person but okay if if i have too much money i'll spend it we believe uh-huh. that yeah so you know she just she makes my magic wallet have a little bit of cash in it every once in a while and then i try not to go over my credit card allowance <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I sometimes fail, but I usually stay okay. Um, but I knew that number, you know, I didn't really need to, as long as I I was provide, as long as the the money in the bank was going to give her as much as money that she needed, um, Mm -hmm. you know, then she was good. So then I had that number to work back from and it made the calculation a lot easier to figure out, you know, how, what the target was as far as, yes, yes. Right. So there's two things there that you said that I want to touch on because they're both really awesome. The first one is that you talk about this guy that came into your life just a handful of times. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm in the middle of reading uh, or actually listening to on Audible, The Traveler's Gift by Andy Andrews. Have okay. you read that book? No, or, but I think I want to. The Traveler's Gift. Oh, Gift. man. Okay. The Traveler's Gift by Andy Andrews. This is becoming, this may end up be, this may end up being my favorite book Um for the year for sure, but definitely one of my top fives. I mean, it is really, really good. Okay. And so I, I enjoy jogging. So I, I love going out and listening to a good podcast or a good audio book when I'm out jogging in the morning. So okay. that's a good one. But the second thing you, you talked about, uh, you talked about the fact that your wife is kind of a money nerd and she likes budgeting. And one of the things I found is that usually in relationships, one person's really good at that and one person isn't. And so mm-hmm. it's it's good to understand that everybody has their strengths. And so the people that have that strength, let them work to it. Don't try to make somebody that doesn't have that strength be something that they're not. Right. But, um, right. Just but don't the, give them that both, job. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's one piece. But then the other thing that my wife and I did, because you used a word there that makes me nervous, which is credit cards. My wife and I, when we really got on the same page for our spending, we started doing the old-fashioned envelope budgeting where we mm. would take cash and put it in envelopes every month. Smart. And for years and years and years, we, we did it that way. And it's actually – 
um, one of the reasons I started creating the retirement budget calculator was because I wanted a better way to do my envelope budgeting. But then there's problems with envelope budgeting and cash. Like, you you know, I put cash in the grocery envelope and then I get money out. I go to the grocery store, I spend it, and then the money ends up in my wallet and I never put it back in the envelope. And then I spend it on paintball with my son or something. You know? <laughs> right, so, right. It so now – you're, and your listeners will probably enjoy this if they're money nerds. What we do now is I use my retirementbudgetcalculator.com to organize my my money so I know you know how much income comes in on the first and then I know exactly what bills I pay on the first and same thing on the 15th. Nice. But then I, uh, I, I signed up for a tool called famzoo.com. And the reason I signed up for famzoo is they have prepaid debit cards. And you can set up as many prepaid debit cards as you want. There's a oh, small wow. fee for, for each card that you set up. Um, and they've got this really great app. So what I do now, instead of envelope budgeting, putting cash in envelopes, I still have my envelopes. Like I have my grocery money, my spending money, my dining out money. But I use FamZoo for their prepaid debit cards. And so twice a month, I transfer cash into those. I distribute the money between all of the prepaid debit cards. And that way I, you know, I have the convenience of using the plastic, the debit card, but I don't ever have to worry about spending more than I'm allowed or allotted because mm. when you run out of money in the debit card, there's no more money to spend. So that's smart. I like that. That's a good plan. Yeah. And now you don't get all the, you know, cr the points. So if right. you're really disciplined, I mean, a lot of people we serve are, you know, millionaires or high net worth people and they use credit cards specifically because they get the points. But I remember hearing Dave Ramsey say, look, those points aren't free. You may be benefiting from them because you're not paying any interest and you're paying them off every month. But there's right. other people uh, in our society, in our culture that are paying 21 percent interest every month mm -hmm. and they're financing your points. And uh -huh. and right. And then you hear stories about these young people that get so so overloaded with debt that they see no way out and they and and they feel that like life's not worth living anymore because of something as stupid as money that's make believe it doesn't right. it's not even real and so uh, but you know they they make it the most important thing and so Dave Ramsey's point is somebody's paying the cost for those points and so I'm I'm not saying you, you shouldn't do it I should just or you know just realize that there's uh, we're there's all connected we're right. all connected yeah right, there right. there's inter interconnectedness that I think Sometimes I feel like we've lost as a society, but knowing that uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction and there's yeah. a price that's being paid. If it's not by you, it's by somebody. Interesting. You just made me think because that's, that's the only reason we use a credit card. Well, two reasons. One is it's convenient and two is because we want points and we pay them off every month, but I never really thought about who's paying that bill. Yeah, of course. It's all those people that aren't paying it off every month. Right. So yeah. I can I could help out. <laughs> Thanks yeah, for that. Be part, yeah, yeah. Be part of the solution, right? Yeah. I like don't it. Don't feed my dad used to say to me as a kid, he said, Jason, don't add confusion to the world. And so um, that's uh, I think about that all the time uh, with every action that you know we take. We just have to think there's consequences associated with them. Amen. That's true. You know, it, it, you've given me something to think about. So let's let's get into this retirement planning thing because I'm I'm like five years away from officially wanting to retire. So I wow I know right <laughs> good timing. I'm glad you're talking to me. This is my area of expertise. It's perfect, right? I know. So I have uh, I made that decision probably earlier this year, and um, you know what I the thing that I didn't know before I got to that decision was, you know, when I was in sort of like accumulation mode and just keep, 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 keep. I never really gave any thought whatsoever to, you know, what, what, what do you do after? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the first thing I did was I went to Mr. Money Must Mustache because mm. he's got a really nice blog post. It's super simple, right? It just gives you like an outline of, you know, the basics, right? But, you know, everything about, retirement and spending money in retirement is so personal, right? It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everybody's situation. Like I'm a retired military guy, so I don't have to think about healthcare. It's already done. I just, it's cheap and I can go to the base and it's basically done. Um, I don't really have to think about, you know, uh, I've got a, a retirement paycheck that'll last until, you know, I die or, you know, 
betray the country, right? <laughs> <Or something. laughs> Which I'm not planning to do. So, <laughs> Which one of those is the better option? <laughs> Thanks oh, for laughing. <laughs> it actually happens, though. Like if if you like go to jail or become a felon or uh, renounce your citizenship, they they don't pay you anymore. <laughs> so anyway, I won't be doing any of those things. Um, but, you know, my point is, is that everybody's retirement plan in retirement is thoroughly their own, you know. So when I go in and do those free retirement cal- calculators, they don't really work specifically for me. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. They just because I can't I can't make the, the Web page realize that I'm a military retiree. There's no checkbox for that. They don't even make one for us. <laughs> You know, so well you're gonna you're gonna love my calculator because oh, cool. it has you can plug all of that stuff in. So if you have guaranteed okay. income, you can right. plug it in, and, and you can get you know granular about your spending. So if you don't have health care, you just don't put that in there. And the, uh, right. you know health care expense. That's yeah. So you right, right. you'll like it. You no, know, it's it's awesome. But any you know, there's just so many things to think about, especially um, you know, like okay, you're doing your drawdown now, right? Okay, year one. What do you do? You know, what do you do first? You know, okay, you're not getting paid anymore by your company or a business or whatever. What money do you spend first? Right. That's that's like one of the major questions that you have to work through. Absolutely. Yeah. The the which buckets you're going to tap into are so much, especially if you're going to retire young. So, you know, we work with people that are retiring in their late 50s. And that means if they don't have like you, they don't have health insurance covered. They're going to they're going to have to private pay for that health insurance. Right. And that's not um, Yeah. And there's there's penalties for accessing retirement accounts before age right. 59 and a half. So right. we've got so to think about that. that. Right. Yeah, so you got to you. We've got all these little nuances, and now also the Affordable Care Act says that the amount of money you pay for your health insurance premiums is based on your modified adjusted gross income. So it's based on your tax return, not on your assets. So we serve people that have millions of dollars saved, but because they're pulling money out of the right accounts um, mm. and their income on their tax return is really low, they pay very little health insurance premiums because it's highly subsidized because, again, the, the health insurance premiums, at least the way it works today, right. is based on your income, not your assets. And Which so nice. it, yeah, so I, I, you know, the thing I always warn people here on retirement planning, I wish there was a simple, you know, we could just apply rule of thumb and everybody should go do it this way. But like you said, it's very personalized. And the piece that I think most people are missing, Jeff, is most people don't have a plan. Most people have right. diversification, they have asset allocation, they have low fees, they have mutual funds and ETFs, and right. they're good at accumulating money. But nobody actually has a distribution, or very few, I would say, of when when because I, I do a lot of public speaking and wor- workshops and webinars. Uh, I would say less than 20% of the people we meet with have any kind of plan for the distribution, the preservation and distribution phase of their life. But the the bigger thing here is if we make this whole retirement exercise all about money, then what ends up happening is as soon as you hit the retirement button, you start to experience discontent. You start to experience like – like you're drifting in life, like what's your mm-hmm. purpose? Because your your purpose up to this point has just been to accumulate money. And now what we're seeing happening is one of the largest, highest divorce rates in our country right now is among the baby boomer generation because they hit this goal, they hit this milestone and they retire and the, and the wife's like, man, I don't really like having you around all the time, you know? <laughs> And the, yes, and, it's true. And the husband and the husband's like, well, geez, my purpose for years has been, you know, Provide figuring out how you. to get better at my work. What am I going to do? So, mm-hmm. I always tell people this exercise of retirement. You, Stephen Covey, a, um, a client, actually gave me his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One time, she Great told book. me, she said, Great Jason, book. start with Chapter Two, and that Chapter Two changed my life because he gives you this exercise of begin with the end in mind, mm. and. And the way that he does the exercise is he says, close your eyes. Imagine you just pull into a church. You walk into the church. It's a funeral. And you walk into the funeral. You go up to the casket. You look inside, and it's you. And mm. then you sit down in the front row of the church. And for the next hour, you listen to your family and your friends and your coworkers talk about your life. And the question, the two questions that I took away from that exercise are, number one, how will I be remembered? Mm, and number right. two, what have I contributed? And for years, I pondered and I thought about those two questions. And I'm telling you, if the focus is only on your money, it's really a shallow focus. It's, right, the, right. it's the wrong thing to be focused on. And one of the reasons I say this, and remember, I'm an investment advisor. I'm a financial advisor. We help people 
a lot of people make this transition. But I remember as a kid reading about the Native Americans in this part of the country where I live out here in the beautiful state of Washington. And the currency that they used at the time was they, they would use seashells um, and different shells had different trading value. Okay. Uh, and there was a time in our own country not that long ago where there were wooden coins being distributed. And so people put all this emphasis on dollars and cents, and these things will eventually become artifacts. I know they will. Right. You know, you know, some, some people talk like Bitcoin may be the future of where that's heading. I'm personally not a big Bitcoin fan myself, right. but what I know is that change is constant. And so if you make your life all about dollars and cents and then the dollars and cents aren't there anymore, um, you know, I'm reminded of the verse. It's the love of money is the problem. That's the root of all evil, not right, the right. Uh, not money itself. Money is just agnostic. It's a tool. It doesn't doesn't change anything or anybody. So and it's one of the things I'm reminded of, too, is Jesus is always putting the focus on on him, you know, on relationship with God, not on not on money. So um, it's a. Uh, he taught about it more than any other subject because he wanted people to know that if you get the focus wrong in, in, in your life, you could end up with a really – an outcome that you may not have planned for. So right. uh, we, well, we always say start with the purpose first. Start with the end in mind. Figure out what you're really passionate about, how you're going to help people, how you're connected, you know, who you love. How you're going to keep contributing and, and have yeah. a, have a re- – yeah, because I went through this malaise because I – when I – uh, quit my job in 2011. Yeah. Uh, I went to college for about three years and then I screwed around <laughs> until <laughs> about 2017. And what I learned is like doing nothing at home is not fun. <laughs> no, it's boring. It's totally yeah. boring and it's lonely and it's sad. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. Don't be like me. I learned the hard way by doing it. Um, it seems like I always do that. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Yeah, I learned the hard way. Yeah, I learned the hard (laughs) way by doing the stupid thing. Um, So I went. It's hard. It's hard to teach it to people that are struggling to get by and they're just barely making it every month. You know, it's hard. It's hard to have the perspective when you're just trying to. You you know, you're working two jobs, and I've done this when I when I lived up in Alaska. I was working at a bank during the day, and I was managing a movie theater at night, and I was taking the bus home because we only had one car. I'd get home at midnight, and I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning and do it all over again. I, I mean, I know what it's like to struggle, and I know what it's like to be broke, and I know what it's like to be poor. But the difference between people that become successful financially and the people that stay poor has nothing to do with how hard you work. It has everything to do with how you think and your psychology. Mm, And if you have the wrong thinking, no matter how hard you work, you're never going to get there. I see this happen all the time. People say, if I could just get a better paying job, if I just had more money coming in, then we'd be okay. But then they end up filing bankruptcy and then they go get two jobs and they file bankruptcy again. You know, it's not it's not because you're not making enough. It's because you've got wrong thinking. And sometimes that's the piece that has to be fixed. It's not making more money. It's not saving more. It's not investing more. It's getting right with your thinking. And so until right. you get until you get your philosophy down straight, you're you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time being successful in the game of life. Right. So you have uh, like my new phrase. Um, you know, we've been we've been laughing at people in beauty pageants for years now because they always talk about world peace and we all go. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I want I want to change the, the the paradigm. OK, so what I've been trying to say this forever, um, but I just recently found a really cool. Uh, have you ever heard of the uh, website called Wait But Why? No. Dot com. OK, it's it's by this guy named Tim urban and uh he's kind of on hiatus but i i found him through tim ferris's podcast Hmm. so anyway he's got like really great long um they're like blog posts but he doesn't like to be called a blog but they're blog posts but they're hugely long and detailed where he goes into a deep dive about subject x right and then and then he'll make a really long funny uh very foul-mouthed um blog post with stick figures <laughs> okay and drawings and and they're amazing um but you really learn a lot um so he did this blog post it was something like uh, i'll link to it in the show notes so everybody can find it but it's um spirituality for atheists i think it was called um and it made me think of because there's you know people are there's a lot of, a lot of people out there that are 
anti-religion these days. So mm. yeah, I try to get like, if there's anything about me, I, I want to be about mindfulness and this thing that I like to call practice personal peace. Because we can do that, right? Personal mm. peace can be a practice that everybody can do. That's not something that you, if you say world peace, everybody's always going to go, that's stupid. <laughs> All right. I, forever, because it's impossible. You're never going to get world peace. But everybody in the world could practice personal peace, I think. Mm. That's mm. more, that's a more realistic goal because you're not worried about the world and anything external to you. You're just going to work on what you can work on, and that's your own personal peace. So I'm, I'm guessing that would be your, uh, relationship with Jesus. Um, that's what it sounds like. But talk a little bit about how you practice personal peace. Man, I'm so glad you brought this subject up um, because there was a time in my life when I identified as an atheist. Okay. Um, and then there was a time somebody challenged me on that once and they said, really, that's a really bold, because when you say you're an atheist, you're saying that I believe without a shadow of a doubt and I can prove to you that there is no God. And so when somebody challenged me on that, I was like, man, you know, that's a pretty bold statement. I'm not that smart to be able to say that I can prove to right. somebody that's a believer that there's a, right. so I was like, well, I, I, I got to step back from that high, uh, you know, very lofty, um, uh, statement. And so what I found was another term. So for years, I identified as being agnostic. And a, right. an agnostic says, well, I'm not going to believe in God until you can prove to me there's a God. Okay. And, you know, this is coming from, as a young man, I grew up in a Christian household. I grew up in a family where we went to church, but I didn't know anything about my faith. It wasn't personal to me. It was just what my parents believed. And so right. it made sense in my early 20s when I started reading the Bible, I was disillusioned because, you know, you hear these, you know, these wonderful stories in Sunday school and then you start reading the Bible and you're like, what in the world? This, what did, you know, what, have I, what did I sign up for? This isn't <laughs> right. what I thought it was. Right, right. I think everybody yeah, so. needs to go through that journey though. That, that it's, spiritual it's, it's, questioning is important. It is really, it is really good. And I, right. and I wouldn't change a thing for mm -hmm. myself because it's made me so strong in, in where I am, I am where I'm at. But, you know, remember I'm the money nerd, right? I think I've got this all figured out. I've been, I've been geeking out on it since I was a kid, but I remember it was, uh, my son was born in July and this was probably, this was December. So it was right before Christmas. And man, we were struggling. I mean, we were struggling. So I, I can't even tell you how, how bad things had gotten financially. We were living in a 900 square foot house. Mm. Um, there's pit bulls running around. There's people dealing drugs. I mean, it was a bad situation. And, wow. and I'm sitting here thinking to myself a couple of things. Number one, I'm thinking, what am I going to teach my son is truth. You know, I grew up with a foundation and a value system that I could lean on. So when you get into those areas of life where there's black, or uh, maybe a gray area, you can, you kind of have something that you can you fall back. And say, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I had that. And I was like, what am I going to teach my son? But then I'll never forget. I mean, the moment that everything changed for me in my life and remember I was pretty far gone. So I had been raised in a Christian family, became an atheist, became an agnostic, but it, it was sit, sitting there right before Christmas. My wife wasn't working anymore. I wasn't making enough money to provide for our family. And we could we didn't have Christmas tree. We didn't have health insurance. We didn't have presents. I mean, you know, it was really, really tough. And it was in that moment that I prayed for the first time, and I really meant it. You know, I, uh, I actually get a little bit emotional thinking about it. But I, I mean, that's when I prayed, and I said, Jesus, you know, I just ask you to come back into my life. I make you my Lord and Savior. You know, please help me. And the next day, man, I tell you, my life changed instantly. It's like I had been in a dark room and somebody flipped a switch on and everything changed. So mm. now people can believe whatever they want to believe, but my experience is so, so strong and it's been so good. And if you read what the Bible says, I mean, I know there's people that have an issue with Christianity and Jesus, and they would rather go down these really, you know, vague trails, like all these different philosophies and, and religions. But God says uh, in the Bible, it says in John uh, 4, 8, it says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Mm. God is love. Right. So if we start with the foundation of, okay, well, I want to reject Christianity, but what's this Bible say? Who does God, who is God? Well, God is love. So you're saying you're going to reject love. You don't, that's not a, a, a value, an attribute uh, right. principle right, that right. you want no, to yeah, Sure. And then, and then Jesus, he's being, you know, he, he comes and he, he, uh, he's being challenged by all the teachers of the day. And they're like, oh, okay, teacher, what's the greatest commandment of all? 
And so simple, you can write it on the back of a business card. He says, love God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he simplifies this whole philosophy. Right. It's this the whole, golden rule, basically. Yeah, but it starts with it starts with loving God because he says God is love. So he says, how can you know what love is without God? And so I get it. I mean, I, yeah, I I'm, I'm just really passionate about it because it changed my life. And oh, yeah. so it's it's easy for me to tell people the story because it's mine. It's true and and, and it's personal uh, to you. And, you, and I know right. what it's like. I mean, the Bible tells a story of the prodigal son, this this young man who yeah. has everything, leaves his dad, goes to do his, uh, you know, figure out life on his own, totally messes it up. And when he returns, the father doesn't cast him back out. The father comes to him with open arms and just runs to him and says, this is my son who I love. I'm glad that he's back. And man, I've had that experience in my life. It's, mm. And it's powerful. And so, you know, all I would say is um, one of the greatest gifts I was ever given is to understand that what we believe today doesn't have to be, be what I believe tomorrow. And right. I, I know what it's like to live the life of the atheist and the agnostic, and I know what it's like to live this life of God that is love, and it's so much better. So, I mean, you know, it's uh, just having the openness to be able to change your perspective, which is so hard to do, because when we put on our atheist goggles, we see the world through the atheist lens, and yeah. we look for reasons to justify that belief right. system. And mm -hmm. then when we put on the lens of God and we see the world through this other lens, then we find all the reasons to justify that. And it's one of my favorite verses says, seek and you will find. Be, mm. careful, what you, be careful what you're looking for, because you right. might find it. If you're looking for reasons to be a skeptic, if you're yeah. looking for reasons to be a non-believer, right. man, you'll find all that stuff. But if, as soon as you say, I'm going to look for reasons to believe— you don't have to divorce your intellect to believe in God. And no, it's I just it's, really it's important that you you remain you can remain skeptical and have faith. I think you need to be skeptical and oh, have the, faith. Oh, the best teachers I know right. all struggle. I mean, faith is not easy. No. Are you kidding me? And no. you think they don't have skepticism? That's why they study as much as they do. They so to. yeah. But you've got to start down the journey. You've got to get off the fence. You, you know, right. if you're gonna make an argument for one or the other, then you better be solid in that belief system. And both right. belief systems require faith. Right. I mean yes. because yeah. and here's a here's a controversial statement. For you know, the faith system is, you know, that we talk about evolution and the science says that there's evolution and, um, and I believe that there's evolution. I believe, you know, when you look at a bird's beak changing over time, is that possible? Absolutely. What I have, a, what I struggle with, with evolution is you say we start with as a single cell organism in the ocean with nothing else. Eventually that single cell organism turns into a fish. Eventually, because the fish tries hard enough over many generations, it's going to climb up onto the, uh, you know, out of the water and begin to develop lungs and breathe. Not one generation, but many generations. And then right. that fish is eventually going to turn into a mammal and that mammal is going to grow legs. And, you know, it's just, it's so, it is so X-Men like. It's so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's so, it's so okay, radical yeah. to think that right. if I try hard enough, like if I, not just me, but if like mm. I get up on my roof of my house and I jump off because I believe I can fly and I'm going to force evolution and I die, my kids and their kids and their kids and their kids, everybody's got to keep doing it. And then the story is, if we believe that and we keep doing it long enough, eventually that our body's going to transform and we're going to fly. So I believe that we can, <laughs> I, I believe that we can evolve as a species, yeah. you know, but to, to be, to go from a turtle to a human, that requires faith. And hmm. you got to put your faith somewhere. And for me, I would rather believe, I would rather have the faith that there's a heavenly father that loves me, that is God, and, mm -hmm. and that that heavenly father says, I was designed with a purpose. And I'm telling you, the people that are struggling is because their philosophy's wrong, their thinking's wrong. And so I'm, I'm passionate about this subject, man. It's that one change will change people's lives more than anything that they do with my calculator or my book <laughs> or my... No, you're so, right. The, uh, the personal peace thing and the faith thing and, uh, and whatever your chosen philosophy is... Uh, be that whatever, you know, I, you know, I know there's a lot of atheists that like that blog post that I mentioned, right? If you were to read that when you get to the end. So, I, and I think a lot of atheists sort of like don't want to admit this, but this is where they're going, right? If you keep pushing the button of, yeah, but what do you really believe in? Yeah, but what do you really believe in? Because you know what you, what you lose a lot of times is 
basically um, an atheist is saying I'm rejecting religion, right? And they don't like the a lot of the the I guess sort of like a lot of what man puts into it, you know, which is sort of corrupts the message. Maybe um, that's just what I think. Um, or they're like so scientific, it's not cool to be religious and scientific. Anyway, um, what this particular atheist, um, when he gets to the end, he says, oh, by the way, I'm totally agnostic and open to the idea of some super intelligent thing out there that's way smarter than us that would seem like magic. <laughs> okay, so maybe that's like his his atheistic view of what God might be is where I'm going with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. The cool thing about it is it, right. there's a faith, there's a there's faith, faith required no matter what you, there. right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And no matter what you want to believe, you have to have some faith in something. And yeah. so, um, Jesus teaches in the Bible that if, all you need is the faith of a mustard seed. Now, remember I've walked the walk. I've been an atheist. I've been an agnostic. Right. And I can just tell you, you know, my life is better as a result of making one simple change. And it was the day that I asked the Lord to into my life to be my Lord and Savior. And, and everything got better from that moment on. So you don't, don't do what I do. But somebody once said to me, find somebody who has what you want, do what they do, and you'll get what they've got. Look at all of the great people that have ever done anything significant that changed the course of history, and you will find somebody of a great faith. Um, right. Look at Abraham Lincoln. Look at yeah. Martin Luther King. Look yeah. at uh, even if you read um, if you read Albert Einstein's letter, right, he says right, right. he says I study things uh, until the answer is so simple that God is answering. So he's a man of science that right. is struggling and grasping with um, with God. I mean, so it, it's the the problem right. really isn't whether or not people believe or don't believe. The problem is most of us have so much going on. We're so busy that it's easier to be intellectually lazy and just say, I don't yeah. believe in anything rather than to take the time and really ask the question, well, what do I believe? Why do I believe it? And what's the ultimate outcome? Because if you trail, if you walk down this, this path of atheism, that nothing matters, that there is no purpose, that there is no design, that you were just an accident, that you're just this one cell it's organism, depressing. that, <laughs> you that can, relationships yeah. don't matter, that there's right. no accountability, that there's right. no, you know, I, I, I mean, it is, it, it really is not just depressing. It's, it's very ugly and it's very me centered. And so people. It's stark, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what you believe, but for me, and that's why, again, you know, I, everybody's got to believe their own thing, but I know we kind of got off track with the money stuff. Here. No, that's okay. I think, you know, when uh, we're going to wrap up, but I, I've had, now you're the second um, financial planner type retirement helper kind of person on the show. And I think the conclusion of both shows was the money thing is the easiest part <laughs> of doing the planning, right? It's everything else about figuring out how you're going to contribute and, and stay engaged in the world, you, that's like more challenging than figuring out how, how big your pile is going to be and how much you can spend. That's kind of easy, really, um, I think. That is a math problem. It's yeah. a math problem, right. I mean, you know, as long as you come to the table and are ready to, uh, you know, give it a go, you're going to work it out. Yeah, it's the numbers are the easiest part. Yes. Um, understanding the purpose, understanding what's most important in your life, understanding the most important people, understanding the ultimate, you know, being able to answer the ultimate question about why you're here. Those those are things that that's worth your time. Yes. Money is uh, money's a tool and it's uh, it's pretty simple once you figure it out. So let's uh, let's tell people how they can best get in touch with Jason Parker. So you're at soundretirementplanning.com. And uh, yes. talk a little bit about that link and the coupon code. Yeah, so soundretirementplanning.com is where I write, and that's where I've been doing a podcast now for 10 years. And, uh, you're and on the radio, right? It's a radio show here in Seattle right. um, in the afternoons on Saturday at 12.30 on 8.20 a.m., the word. Um, and then we uh, – so that's the, that's kind of the hub, soundretirementplanning.com. From there, there is a link to retirementbudgetcalculator.com. That's the software as a service that we right. develop. Um, and, uh, or you can just go directly to retirementbudgetcalculator.com. The coupon code, if people want to sign up for that, it's uh, podcast. They get 50% off the cost of the calculator. 
And so and do it now and do it soon because it, we are it's working. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know when people are going to be listening to this. So if they're listening to it way in the future, we have, may have already changed the pricing to a right. subscription model and we are going to be grandfathering people in. So if they pay the one-time fee, they're not going to have to pay the subscription model. But uh, we, I mean, we are in works right now and we're planning on making it a $10, uh, $10 a month, a uh, monthly subscription because the calculator just keeps getting better and better and better. So right, right. It, obviously if people, um, are interested in that tool, they, they're going to be better served to buy it now rather than later. This has been a blast, Jason. Jeff, uh, I totally <laughs> love this film. Man. I so, I, man, I'm so glad that you uh, had the courage to go out and create something. To, and I've listened to several of your shows now to go out and you know interview people, let them tell their story. And you do it in such a fun way. You know, I, your, your laugh. I, I'm sure that uh, one day when people are remembering your life, they're probably going to remember that laugh of yours because it is, uh, it's a good one. And so it's my I, job, and I think, I think Jesus, you're very, God put me here to in, entertain people with this laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you're very honorable. You're very respectful. I mean, you, you try not to offend people. And I totally, I just totally appreciate your ability to uh, help people tell a story and that you had the courage to do it. Thanks for creating something, building something, being an entrepreneur. It's awesome. Thank you, sir. You have a good one. All right. Thanks. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.